Now, there are four major types of connective tissues in the body. Remember, we have connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone, and blood. And in the following slides, we're going to go into the major categories of each. So with connective tissue proper, uh, this is what uh, is formed by the fibroblasts. And it consists of all connective tissues except for bone, um, cartilage, and blood. So what we find then is that CT proper is pretty abundant. Now there are two major subclasses of CT proper. Um, we got CT proper loose and CT proper dense. So the loose connective tissues here include areolar, adipose, and reticular, and the dense connective tissues are the dense regular, irregular, and elastic. So we're going to go through each of the, the subtypes here, uh, talk about their structure and their function and location in the body. So the first type we're going to talk about here are the loose connective tissues. And this one here is showing loose areolar connected tissue. So loose areolar visually looks loose because you have some reticular fibers here, you have some interspersed cells, and a lot of ground substance. Now the key here is the amount of ground substance. Because of the fact that it has a lot of ground substance, this gel-like matrix, it is widely distributed under the epithelia of your body. And it's Due to the fact that this ground substance can dissolve nutrients and wastes, it makes sense how areolar connective tissue can nourish other tissues like epithelial tissues, which are avascular. If you remember, epithelial tissues don't have their own blood vessels going through them, and instead they need to be supported and nourished by an underlying connective tissue. So this one here is showing lamina propria, which is an example of loose areolar connective tissue you find in the walls of a lot of internal organs. And it makes sense how this type of connective tissue would nourish epithelia because it has a lot of ground substance that could dissolve nutrients and those nutrients then could diffuse up into the epithelium and supply nutrients to those cells. Now the next type here is called adipose, again another loose connective tissue. And adipose is called that because it's mostly made of adipocytes. And these adipocytes are the fat cells you can see here. Uh, they are full of lipids. And these lipids are so abundant within the cytoplasm of these adipocytes that it pushes the nucleus off to the side here. So each one of these large circles is an adipocyte, and they function in storing lipids. Now, adipose, as a connective tissue, is pretty widely distributed around your body. Uh, it functions in basically insulation, protection, and cushioning, but also uh, you know, energy storage because it stores lipids. Uh, you find it you know, just beneath the skin. It actually uh, is found around your kidneys to support their position, around your eyeballs, as well as uh, around your abdominal organs, and uh, is also the major filler material within the breast itself. So remember, when you think of adipose, look for these large circles here. And in terms of its uh, function, it's involved with energy storage because it stores lipids, but also insulation, protection, and cushioning. Now, the next type of loose connective tissue proper is the reticular connective tissue. So reticular connective tissue is called that because it has lots of reticular fibers here. And it's identifiable because of these reticular fibers and it isn't quite as loose as the other loose connective tissues. Now, because of these reticular fibers in reticular connective tissue, it serves as a nice sort of supporting medium for a lot of solid organs. So some of the organs that, that have a lot of reticular connective tissue would be things like your lungs, your bone marrow, your spleen, your liver, and uh, these actually can help support those tissues because it forms a stroma or the basically the kind of the filler material of those organs. Now we're going to move on to the three types of the dense connective tissues. So this one here is called dense regular connective tissue. And it, this is first of all visually identifiable because of the fact that it looks pretty dense in relationship to the last ones we saw. You know, if you go back to reticular connective tissue, you see it's got a lot of ground substance and open space here. But if you move over to the first type of dense CT, you see there's not a lot of ground substance here. There is even not a lot of cells. You see that the nuclei of these cells are so smushed, they just look like little lines here. And really what fills in most of this dense regular connective tissue are fibers. In fact, all of this sort of wavy reddish material are collagen fibers and they're all lined up in the same plane or direction. Now, this is what gives it its dense regular name. First of all, it's densely packed with fibers, and they all have a regular appearance or pattern here. Now, uh, in terms of its structure, we know that there's a lot of collagen fibers present, 
And that gives it a certain function, which is to basically help for attachment of muscles and ligaments, or basically tendons and ligaments. So it can withstand lots of tensile stress, stress because all of these are, act like little ropes that all line up in a row, and they can pull and resist tension very well. So you find that dense, regular connective tissue is found in tendons and ligaments, as well as aponeuroses, which are very broad tendons. And, um, you know, functionally, it can resist a lot of stress because of its collagen fibers. Now, this one here is called dense, irregular connective tissue. And it makes sense because the fibers here have a more irregular pattern to them. Now, you're going to find this, um, that it's actually, you know, strong, like dense, regular, However, this is going to resist tension in many different directions. So in this regard, it can provide lots of structural strength and resisting tension in many directions allows it to be located and uh, function well within things like fibrous joint caps capsules, um, within organs and joints, as well as the dermis of your skin and the submucosa of your digestive tract because all of these locations resist stress in many different directions. You know, think about like the fibrous capsule of your of your shoulder. You know, when you move your arms around, that's going to be uh, lots of stress in many different directions. So it makes sense that you want tissue to resist that stress in many different directions. Same with skin and your digestive tract. These can move a lot in lots of different ways. So it makes sense that you want dense, irregular connective tissue to be in the walls of those organs. Now, uh, elastic connective tissue is named that because it has lots of elastic fibers. Now, if you look at this, it almost looks like dense regular in the sense that these fibers are all kind of going in the same direction. However, elastic fibers look differently because they're a little thicker here in terms of the staining, and uh, they seem like darker lines, and they look a little bit more wavy as well. Now, this elastic connective tissue is located in uh, tissues that need to have a lot of elastic recoil. And you're going to find this in places like large arteries, certain ligaments, uh, also along the vertebral column and in the walls of your bronchial tubes, which is your airways, which need to be able to stretch, like expand and then recoil back to a resting shape. So this elastic connective tissue is really good at elasticity and it makes sense that your aorta, which is the largest artery of your body, would have elastic connective tissue in the walls because this needs to be able to expand and accommodate the pressure or force of blood that's being ejected out of your heart. Now, the next type of connective tissues we're going to talk about are the cartilages. So cartilage is different than CT proper because all cartilage is avascular, whereas CT proper has blood vessels, and their cell types are going to be different. We find that the major cell type of cartilage is the chondrocyte. Remember, chondrocytes are the mature forms of the chondroblasts, which make cartilage. And uh, these chondrocytes exist within tiny cavities within cartilage called lacuna, now, most of cartilage is water. It has some packed collagen fibers as well. Um, now, we think about cartilage in terms of its characteristics as being tough but flexible. And it also lacks nerve fibers so that when cartilage is injured, it's hard to tell that it is injured. Now, um, we say that cartilage is avascular because it lacks blood vessels, but it still re receives nutrients from a surrounding connective tissue called perichondrium. Perichondrium is a dense, irregular connective tissue that surrounds cartilage, and it gives rise to the chondroblasts and chondrocytes, which can help to repair damaged cartilage or allow that cartilage to grow, you know, uh, wider. Now, in terms of the three types of cartilage, we got hyaline, elastic, and fibro. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant. This is what you call gristle, like on the ends of uh, bone. Now, uh, it appears as kind of a shiny, bluish, glassy sort of appearance under the microscope. And you find this at the tips of long bones and your nose, like nasal cartilage, your trachea, your larynx, as well as the cartilage of your ribs is all considered hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage is similar to hyaline, but it has a lot more elastic fibers. And you find this in areas like your ears and epiglottis, not to be confused with elastic connective tissue. They're not made of the same thing. Elastic cartilage has elastic fibers, but it's still considered cartilage because it has chondrocytes and chondroblasts, and its characteristic is much different than elastic connective tissue. Now, fibrocartilage is actually stronger because it is um, really rich in uh, collagen fibers, and because of its strength, you're going to find this in places like between your vertebrae as well as in your knee joint forming the meniscus there. 
Now the first type we'll talk about here is the hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is amorphous and has a firm matrix, and its matrix is kind of glassy here. Now uh, it's identifiable because it's the fibers aren't really clearly identifiable in this tissue here, but we can see the chondrocytes. And these, each one of these cells is a chondrocyte, and it's located within a small space called a lacuna. And this glassy matrix is really the characteristic of hyaline cartilage. Now remember, hyaline cartilage is located in your nasal cartilage, uh, along the respiratory passages, at the ends of long bones. And interestingly enough, hyaline cartilage serves as the precursor to most bone in your body. So most bone starts out as hyaline cartilage before it's converted to bone. Now, you also find it forming the costal cartilages of your ribs, and this uh, allows for a little bit of give of your ribs. That way your thoracic wall can expand and contract uh, during normal ventilation. So elastic cartilage is a little bit more rare than, than hyaline cartilage. In fact, you're going to only really find this in two major areas, and that's your external ear or pinna, as well as the epiglottis, which is the, a structure that prevents food and drink from passing into your airway. Uh, you do find some elastic cartilage supporting the eustachian tubes, which are a tube that connects your middle ear to your nasopharynx as well. Now, elastic cartilage is identifiable because uh, it doesn't have as much of a glassy matrix as hyaline cartilage did. Instead, these fibers actually appear more prominently and because uh, these are elastic fibers. You can still see our chondrocytes located within our lacuna. And uh, it's similar to hyaline, but it's more elastic. So that way, you know, if you bend your ears down, it'll recoil back to a resting shape because of this elasticity. Now, fibrocartilage is identifiable because of the fact that it's got lots of fibers. You might look at this and think, oh, this looks kind of like dense, regular connective tissue. Now, um, it's identifiable against dense, regular connective tissue because of the fact that you can see chondrocytes located within lacuna. Remember, dense, regular CT had more flattened nuclei that looked more smushed. In fact, um, usually this type of cartilage actually has more of a blue stain as well. Now the matrix is firm because of these collagen fibers and it provides some tensile strength to absorb compressive shock. So in that regard, you're going to find a lot of fibrocartilage in the intervertebral discs between your vertebrae as well as the pubic symphysis um, between the two halves of your pelvis and the menisci or discs of your knee joint because this is a very tough type of cartilage due to the fact that it's got a lot of collagen fibers. Now, bone is also a different type of connective tissue, and we call this osseo osseous tissue. Now, although bone itself is a connective tissue, when you talk about bone as an organ system, it also contains other tissues within it. But we can think of bone or osseous tissue as, as its own separate tissue as well. In terms of its structure and function, it has a lot more car uh, collagen than cartilage. It also has a more mineralized matrix, which makes it harder and uh, functionally it supports and protects body structures, also stores fat and synthesizes blood because uh, a lot of bones contain marrow that can make new blood cells. Now, um, its major cell type is the osteoblast, which produces the bony matrix, and osteocytes, which maintain the existing matrix. Like cartilage, bone has um, basically a little lacuna. However, the cells that occupy these spaces are the osteocytes rather than the chondrocytes. Osteons are the structural units of compact bone. Also, bone differs from cartilage because it's rich, richly vascularized. Cartilage is avascular, whereas bone is highly vascular. So looking at bone under the microscope, you can see that it looks much different than cartilage. Um, in each of these little circles here is uh, the structural unit of compact bone called the osteon. They're basically rings of, of bony material that are concentric. And between these rings, you find that each one of these little dark circles is basically an osteocyte located within a lacuna, and they all communicate with each other through these small cavities called canaliculi, and that actually allows them to transport nutrients from the central region called the central canal, which contains your blood vessels and nerve fibers. Uh, in terms of its location, you know, it's pretty much everywhere in your body. Uh, however, functionally, it's involved with supporting and protecting uh, it also helps store minerals for later use. It also has um, bone marrow, which is involved with blood cell formation and storing fats. Now, the reason why bone is so hard is that it's 
its extra southern matrix is hard and calcified with uh, hydroxyapatite minerals, which are basically calcium and phosphate. And um, that's what gives us bone its sort of hard characteristic. In fact, bone is stronger than steel in terms of its tensile strength. Now, blood is also a different type of connective tissue, and it's the most atypical because you don't think of blood as being a connective tissue, but it's still considered that because of the fact that it comes from mesenchyme. Now, um, blood, like other connective tissues, has all three components. You've got cells, fibers, and ground substance. The cells of blood are your red blood cells and white blood cells, or leukocytes. The fibers are actually soluble, so that normally when blood is in its fluid state, its protein fibers are more soluble and dissolve within the, the plasma fluid component of blood. However, those fibers can precipitate when blood forms a clot which gives blood actually kind of a more solid characteristic at that point. Now, functionally, it's involved with transportation of nutrients, wastes, and gases, as well as other substances, and we still consider blood a connective tissue because, again, it's derived from mesenchyme. So in terms of what blood looks like, you can see it doesn't look like any of the other connective tissues. Basically, you see a lot of ground substance, except here we call that plasma. You can see different types of cells, like our red blood cells and our white blood cells, and platelets here. Now, the only true cell here is the white blood cell because this is a living cell. The red blood cells don't have a nucleus. In fact, they don't live very long for that reason, so it's not a true cell. And the platelets aren't even true cells either because platelets are basically just little fragments of cells. And um, in fact, on here, it just looks like a little bit of smudge of material on the slide. You don't see the fibers presently because this is when blood is in its uh, liquid state. However, when blood clots, the, the protein fibers you find within plasma can stick together and form a mesh, which then allows for blood to become more solid rather than a liquid. In terms of its location, you should only find blood within blood vessels. If you're finding blood elsewhere, then the blood vessels have ruptured, and that's when you have a hematoma, which is essentially a leakage of blood within a tissue.